For those of us who grew up in the 1950s, there was only one universal monster, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Dracula, Frankenstein, and the others had not yet been released to TV, and the creature was the kind of film you could only see in a theater. You see, it was originally released in 3D, one of those great 50s gimmicks Hollywood unleashed to stay competitive with television. But even without 3D, the film was a smash hit and has become an undisputed classic of its kind. I recently talked to some of the original cast members and to some other people with special insights into the creature's charisma. So come with me now as we take a nostalgic journey back to the Black Lagoon. The creature from the Black Lagoon ushered in a new age of monster making. There would be no alien without the creature from the Black Lagoon. There would be no predator without the creature from the Black Lagoon or every elaborate monster since then owes him a debt of some sort. He was really a nice guy. They were the interlopers. They came to his home. It'd be the same thing if you went home tonight and you found about five or eight or 10 people having a party in your living room, how would you feel? There is a poignancy to the creature that you think, oh, oh, it's too bad. He's, he's such an ugly creature because he has something in him that longs to be better, that longs to be human, that longs to love. And, and uh, there's something that touches our heart. Legends about underwater monsters are as old as recorded history. Frightening tales of humanoid sea serpents, sirens, mermaids, and mermen are staples of world folklore, perhaps because they remind us of our own ancient links to the deep. Be they swamps, lagoons, or the open sea, watery locations have always been a perfect place for scary stories, from pulp magazines to Hollywood blockbusters. But nearly a quarter century before Jaws took its bite out of popular culture, Universal Studios had already given the world another classic reason to stay out of the water. The Creature from the Black Lagoon was, was built on a tradition that really began with a silent film called The Lost World, based on Arthur Conan Doyle's novel, in which a group of scientists venture to a lost plateau in Brazil where prehistoric animals roam free. Universal producer William Allen combined the Lost World concept with a purportedly true story he had been told at a dinner party about an amorous half-man, half-fish that was said to live in the Amazon River. Following some preliminary treatments, screenwriters Arthur Ross and Harry Essex developed a script called Black Lagoon, which remained the film's working title through production. For director, Allen chose Jack Arnold, who had directed Universal's previous science fiction spectacular, It Came From Outer Space, another Allen production. Arnold would soon become Universal's top specialist in 50s sci-fi, his many films including Tarantula and The Incredible Shrinking Man, which would be remembered as his masterpiece. It Came From Outer Space had been produced in 3D, a process then at the height of its popularity. Since no 3D film had yet been shot underwater, it was a foregone conclusion that the Black Lagoon would literally leap off the screen. It's almost impossible to explain to a young viewer what it was like to see a 3D movie during the heyday of 3D films. And envision, if you will, that you're sitting in an audience and suspended before you is a three-dimensional cube of water. Remarkable how vivid that was. Two interlocked cameras photographed each scene from slightly different perspectives. The lightweight underwater version of the 3D rig was specially designed by cameraman Scotty Welburn. In theaters, precisely synchronized projectors overlapped the images, which were fused into three dimensions by the use of polarizing filters. This was a uh, projection filter that would have been used um, for one of the two projectors. The light would pass through this filter uh, be polarized and then reflect from the silver screen and then the audience uh, would be wearing these type of Polaroid glasses so each eye would only see the uh, image 
coming off either the left or right projector. And that's what was utilized to achieve the 3D effect. Since the screenplay insisted on an object for the creature's affection, it was only appropriate that Universal Ingenue Julia Adams, later known as Julie, was one of the first performers to be cast. Well, in those days, the studio simply assigned us movies to do. And uh, when I was assigned this picture, I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to do a horror picture or whatever. So, uh, but I was a pretty good little girl, so I usually did what they said. And uh, so, and then once I got into it, uh, I, I had a lovely time. Actor Richard Carlson, the star of It Came From Outer Space, became a fixture of science fiction films through his portrayals of scientist heroes. Quite a change for Hollywood, where most scientists were mad, or at least bent on world domination. He had a wonderful kind of sophistication about him that I thought worked very well in these pictures because uh, when you put Richard Carlson there and he believes in what's going on, it gives it a great ring of truth because you think, wow, it must be true. But what would the creature look like? And more important, who would play him? The first actor considered for the role was Glenn Strange, a former stuntman who had played the Frankenstein monster in three Universal films. But Strange didn't consider himself much of a swimmer and turned the part down. Rico Browning was a college student at the time Universal began scouting underwater locations in Florida. And someone suggested to Universal or to uh, the producer, uh, William Allen, I believe his name was, uh, that Wakala Springs would be a very good location for the creature to be filmed. It was uh, a very eerie looking place, mainly because Ed Ball, who owned it, had protected it over the years and it was just un totally undeveloped as far as civilization is concerned. So uh, Jack Arnold and Scotty Welburn, who was the cameraman, uh, I picked them up at the airport, took them to the springs and uh, showed them around and they liked what they saw. And Scotty got his underwater camera out and he asked me if I would swim in front of the camera so they could get some perspective as to the size of logs and people and fish and whatever in the grass. And I said, sure, so I did. I'd say it's a couple of weeks later, maybe three weeks, I got a call from Jack Arnold and he said, uh, we like the way you swim. He said, how would you like to be the creature of the Black Lagoon? I said, well, I don't know what it is, but fine. We shot everything of the first of the first unit on the back lot at Universal. And the underwater scenes were shot in Florida and for the clarity of the water and so on. So we were really shooting those two parts at the same time. But um, the illusion somehow is, uh, is, is that we are truly in a very mysterious and faraway place. Two units, of course, required two creatures, as well as swimming doubles for the principal actors. Ben Chapman, a 24-year-old Universal contract player, portrayed the gill man above water. Well, the part called for a tall person, you know, 6'5". Uh, actually, Universal Studios had him as 6'5", 300 pounds, and I didn't weigh 300 pounds. But once I got into the suit uh, with the helmet, I, we, we call the head, and the bottom of it, uh, it put me at about 6'7". So it gave him a more imposing stature Today, the creature's appearance is so familiar that it's almost a shock to learn that the original concept was very different. The head of the studio, uh, Mr. Mull, Ed Mull, uh, had a different vision of the creature. He wanted something that was a little like the Oscar figure, sort of eel-like, almost. It didn't have as many gills or, or, or uh, uh, bumps on the face or the head, and uh, it was slicker, I would say. Not quite as busy as the, uh, the final creature did. He's more streamlined, which is it's kind of a cool thing, but he does look you know, quite a bit different. He does have the fins in the back. That was, they retained that and kept that pretty much. So they made it all up and we tested it. They tested it in the, in the tank there at Universal and then the decision was made that no, it did not work. Now, I was told, there's nothing to back this up, but the sculptor, Chris Mueller, who did this, said he had heard later on this might become the uh, female creature if they did that in a sequel. Uh, that uh, they never did it, but this, and this probably would have worked, too. It would have been a nice, uh, nice little female creature, I think. Universal's head of makeup was Bud Westmore, who had replaced the legendary Jack Pierce. Unlike Pierce, Westmore supervised a large creative staff. 
Well, the look of the creature was created by Millicent Patrick. She was a gal that worked over at uh, Universal and did a lot of designs for different films and stuff. And she actually came up with this, this little fella here. I think it was kind of her dream child. She loved him. It looked exactly like her sketches. I have a special interest in Millicent Patrick mostly because she has been rendered so invisible by time. Uh, she clearly had a lot to do with sketching the concepts for the creature. Uh, all versions, she went on tour to promote the movie when it first came out because she was so photogenic. And she was such an, a good interview subject and she was so talented. And uh, I get the impression that her contribution was kind of buried by Bud Westmore. Westmore's construction team, headed by Jack Kevan and Chris Mueller, made full body molds of both actors on which they built a flexible exterior shell. And then they had different sculptors. They had a crew of about nine guys that all worked. And one guy would work on the chest part, one guy would work on the arms. Because, I mean, there's a lot of work here. One sculptor just couldn't do all of this. As far as the head goes, it was sculpted by Chris Mueller, a very fine sculptor. But I've always given credit to the person that put me together from the inception to the back lot, Jack Kevan. And I just feel that Jack Kevan never got the recognition that he should have, because he was kind of overshadowed by Bud Westmore. This particular head is one of the last castings out of the Ben Chapman mold, the land creature mold. And then my friend Bill Malone actually built and just reconstructed this whole suit, and it's exactly, I mean, almost every scale is where the actual suit was. Ben Chapman was here and thought this was one of his suits. I mean, it fooled him totally. The Creature from the Black Lagoon suit is a one big one-piece body stocking where they sculpted everything and put it on to the suit. And I, I had to watch my weight because I couldn't gain weight or lose weight because then it would fold. So it has a, took me two to three hours to get in and out because it has to be put in exactly right. They put me in a leotard, um, uh, full bodied, and uh, then they would paint glue on the leotard and put pieces of, of uh, foam rubber that was molded to see the texture of skin this uh, creature would have on it. And sometimes when they would put the glue on, it would go through the leotard and it would s start setting up and get very hot and it would burn me in several places. I still have a little scar from one of them. Well, the underwater suit was different from this one, mainly because uh, Rico Browning was a lot smaller. So the whole suit was built in smaller scale. They used pieces of this suit and scaled it down. In fact, you see this part in here well, on Rico's suit, that part isn't there. It's put together because he was smaller. Now, you never see them together, so you never see that. There are slight differences in the head, too, because like Chris said, when he was sculpting it, uh, both their heads were totally di different configurations, you know? Uh, like Ben's head was, was more round, I think, and, and maybe Rico's might have been more oval or, or which way. And so he had trouble getting the same end result, but it worked very close, and as long as you didn't see them together, you never, you never saw it but it's all foam rubber so they could get you know, movement out of it they needed. They had a special head that they made up that made the gills flex when they were when he was sitting and you'd see this that kind of a thing, which they ran tubes up and, and had compressed air hitting in these things. They had bladders and they would actually come out, but that was just for a head for that one shot where you saw him. They were originally going to build it so that I could wear a face mask, but when we attempted to do that, found out the face mask stuck out much too far and you couldn't do it. And then we talked about using uh, swimming goggles, you know, like this. I stopped that mainly because uh, you, when, you, when you have the goggles on inside the head and water gets in, you have no way of getting the water out of the goggles. So I chose not to have anything on and just shoot it with uh, your bare eyes, so to speak. Although some special publicity photos featured a brightly colored creature, the actual suit was much less flamboyant. Well, the original creature was this uh, sort of a s soft moss green, a very, very subtle color so that it picked up shadows and, and uh, it had the feeling of, of reality, of flesh really being there. And most of the recreations are too bright. They're, they're much too vivid a green, and as you say, sometimes, and sometimes the lips are red, and uh, it's, uh, they're garish compared to the original. In addition to the creature's elaborate costume, the film featured another eye-catching piece of specially constructed apparel, the heroine's bathing suit. Well, I wanted it to be a unique bathing suit. 
they didn't want to go to the store and buy one. And it was rather racy for its day because it was pulled up a bit at the thigh here. Now it's so tame, of course, but uh, so that it had its its own look. And it was always very difficult to get it to get it on every day with the body makeup, so the body makeup didn't get on the white. Naturally, they made three or four. The underwater scenes were supervised on location by James C. Havens, while the Hollywood unit was personally directed by Jack Arnold. I had a lot of respect for Jack. We wound up the best of friends. But he was a tough director, a no-nonsense director. When I first got the part, I went up to Jack and I said, uh, how do you want me to play him? He said, the only thing I don't want you to do is don't make a cartoon out of him. You know, clump, clump, clump. And he said, no, I don't want you to walk. I want you to kind of glide, because remember, he, he's a, a fish. He comes out of the water. So we want you to kind of glide. So one day I came into the studio and he said, Ben, I solved your problems. I said, how's that? Underneath of my boots that I used to put on, they had attached 10 pound weights flattened out. Although production went smoothly for both units, there were some minor mishaps caused by the creature costume's restricted field of vision. I was carrying Julie in my arms through this cave and, and she was, you know, slung over my arms with her head down. And I couldn't see where I was going, and clunk, I went wide into one of these artificial rocks. And I had no idea what happened. She started kicking, and, then, and they were yelling, cut. I can't say I was truly injured, but it gave me a bit of a start. You know, first of all, I'm freezing cold, trying not to, trying not to have goosebumps and the bump. There's a famous picture that, that appeared in the newspaper of uh, Dick Carlson, Dick standing myself. Jack Arnold and a nurse patching her up. We took a couple of hours off and Julie was ready to go again, you know, put a little makeup on it. But she was a very professional lady. When Creature from the Black Lagoon was released in 1954, even the most die-hard classic monster fans were impressed. Yeah, I didn't know what the creature was. I mean, I, I saw pictures of it. It looked like a neat monster guy. But I had no idea what I was really going to see. And when I went to see the creature, it was the days you could stay in the theater all day. I think I stayed there and saw it four times in a row. Creature's highly dramatic musical score contributed materially to the film's success. In addition to library themes, original music was provided by three composers, Henry Mancini, Hans J. Salter, and Hermann Stein. Science fiction films have, have a requirement that romances don't have and crime melodramas don't have, and that is that you have to kind of get suckered into believing that these ridiculous events can actually be taking place. There, there is no link between man and fish, but you watch Creature from the Black Lagoon and you're convinced that, yes, yeah, somehow this, this happened. And you don't think about these things generally because the stories are well written, but you also don't think about these things because you get emotionally involved in the pictures. And emotional involvement comes in a large part in these films due to the music. <laughs> One thing it has which sets it apart from most of the other pictures is it has a theme that is just beaten to death. You can hardly get a single view of them without the theme sounding, and I think it sounds about 130 times in the picture. The other reason why there's a lot of music in Creature from the Black Lagoon is because there's a lot of scenes without dialogue and sound effects, and that's because a lot of the scenes take place underwater. And nobody wants to listen to bubbles for 20 minutes. So instead, we get wonderful music there. While dramatically effective, the use of a composite score was not the preferred method of working for most composers. And the composers were against this form of scoring. This is a very primitive form of scoring, going back to really the beginning of film music in the, in the 30s. But they were obviously told from on high, if you know, you're scoring this picture and we want to hear the creature theme every time. So they no doubt grumbled a little and they did their job. And their job was to incorporate this very intrusive theme. It's not very musical, it's a very strident theme played on uh, fluttered tongue trumpets, which is really gets to your gut there, but they had to somehow incorporate that into their music every time they saw the creature. The 
composers were rather typecast, even at this early stage of their careers. Henry Mancini, even at this early stage, was, was known to be the person who wrote light music, not light in the standpoint of not good and not complex. He was a fabulous writer right from the start. But he wrote romantic melodies. He wrote playful melodies. Uh, Herman Stein was kind of a jack of all trades. Herman got main titles and end titles. Uh, he also got uh, a lot of scenes that were devoid of dialogue and uh, sound effects. He did the great swimming sequence with Julia Adams and the creature. They would give Hans Salter the horror sequences. So Hans scored a lot of the end of the picture when the creature is attacking. Get back, Kate. Get back. <laughs> What I like about Creature's score is it is, it's a marvelous patch job of a score. Uh, it takes music from horror films of the 40s like The Wolfman and Ghost of Frankenstein. It takes westerns like the James Stewart Bend of the River. It takes all of these disparate elements, combines them with original music, and somehow shuffles them together, re-records them, and makes this score unlike any of the other universal horror sci-fi pictures. And uh, I, I kind of like the way everything somehow hangs together. Everyone thinks they watch it and they hear their favorite creature music, and they're always shocked when they find out, well, no, this music was originally written to accompany a scene where a doctor is curing a sick horse. One of the film's most memorable sequences is the provocative pas de deux between Julie Adams and her underwater admirer. It is one of those, those concepts, one of those images that is on the surface, rather straightforward. He's curious, he's observing, he's in his natural element. There's a different shape up there that I haven't seen before. Um, perfectly simple and straightforward, but at the same time, it carries with it overtones, connotations, implications. And a number of authors have talked about how sexual this exchange is. I was eight years old in 1954 when this movie played in theaters. And I must have thought about its sexual content because I remember thinking to myself when Julia Adams first jumps into the water and we see the view of her from below and she's backlit by the light that's filtering through the, through the water and she could be completely nude. A fellow named John Baxter correctly pointed out years and years ago in a book called Science Fiction and Cinema, he said it was a stylized representation of sexual intercourse and he's absolutely correct. Uh, Jack Arnold, told me this was correct. But it's done on a very subliminal level. It's not, it's not as overt as many film historians would like us to believe. It is like a love dance. And, and you feel his, his heart, that, uh, that he's falling in love with this, uh, with this creature who's swimming on top of the water and swimming here, and he looks and so on. So it's really a love scene. What's important for the viewer is not so much that this is some sort of sexual interplay between the creature and this woman of a completely different species. It's the idea that for the viewer, this subtext connects and makes the creature's affection for her seem palpable. And as long as one doesn't stop to think about the logic of it uh, and is propelled by the action of the film from that point on, and we're left breathless and logic doesn't enter into it at all. But because we linger, the longer we linger, the more overtones it seems capable of, of holding for us. And because he is swimming in, in a kind of matched action with hers, it's like a mirror reflection. You can't help but think that the creature is some embodiment of instinct, of force, and it's under the surface of the of the civilized modern humans. Um, it's lurking there while the, the calm, placid movement continues on the surface. Jack Arnold often inserted subtle social commentary into his films, and Creature displays intriguing clues of a burgeoning environmentalism. There's, there's a su very surprising, to me it was very surprising shot in the film where we see the heroine simply standing on the deck of the boat, waiting for something and f finishing a cigarette. And then she takes her cigarette and just tosses it into the water. 
I don't know how I would have reacted to that in 1954. I probably would have taken it for granted. Of course, this is what everybody does. Just toss your cigarettes wherever you want. But I look at that now, and I think, go pick that up. And then the camera moves over and shows the creature looking up. Now, he's probably looking up at her, because he's had his eye on her for a little while now. But the way the cigarette links them, we have it appear as if he is noticing what she's doing to his world. There's a transition at that point. The very next scene shows the results of the scientist's attempt to use this native poison to render unconscious the creature. They have scattered this in, in the lagoon. And so juxtaposing that to the business with the cigarette, I can't help but think, what are you doing to the ecology and to the whole natural world of this, this lagoon? Putting those pieces together in that fashion certainly suggests to me somebody in making that film wanted to make an implication and succeeded. Since the Gill Man made a considerable splash with his first film, a sequel wasn't far behind. They bring the creature back to civilization. Uh, it literally could have begun on the next day after the end of the final events in the first movie. And having brought him back to civilization, it is only fair that he get loose and raise havoc and like King Kong, you know, kidnap the girl of his dreams who was transmogrified from Julie Adams into Laurie Nelson, but never mind. It's another pale creature in white that he has a hankering for. In those days, most people didn't want to do um, science fiction or creature pictures or whatever you wanted to call them. Uh, it was kind of like it was taboo or you were considered down on your luck, so to speak, if you had to do one. Of course, now they've got a, a tremendous cult following. Um, the science fiction genre is very popular, very collectible, and um, the films at Universal the um, science fiction films were very well done. And as it turned out, it's probably one of the films that I'm most remembered for. Oh! Hey, take it easy. Well, John Agar and I were scientists, ichthyologists, if you will. I'm studying ichthyology. Ichthyology? That's a dead dollar <laughs> word. How about explaining it to us? Well, ichthyology is the study of fish. I see. Wait for me! Like the heroine of the first film, the female scientist in Revenge created romantic vibrations among certain land creatures as well. well aren't you going to wait for him? What? Let Mr. America cut into my cake? What's the matter, old timer, poop out? <laughs> Shouldn't walk these brain boys so fast, tell them they can't take it. You know, strong upstairs, but no stamina. Once more, Rico Browning played the swimming creature in a production shot almost entirely at Florida's Marineland Studios. Get that camera here, quick. When we did the second creature film, I said, uh, well, hey, how about let's get credit for being the creature? And uh, they gave me a big argument and said, no, we'll give you a lot of publicity, uh, help you get other jobs. And I said, no, I want credit, but uh, they wouldn't credit anybody as a creature. Although Rico didn't receive an on-screen credit, he did turn in an out-of-costume cameo appearance as a laboratory assistant. We just all got along great. It was kind of like a family. And John was such a super guy to work with. One night we had a big water fight uh, at the motel and uh, just about wrecked the place. Another unbilled cameo turn was made by a young performer who, later in his career, would never have to worry about the marquee value of his name, Clint Eastwood. Like many science fiction films of the Cold War period, Revenge featured obligatory scenes of invasion and social turmoil. Ronald Brown did a marvelous uh, uh, series of paintings for the ad campaign for that film in which the creature is carrying a woman. But in the background, there's this enormous consternation, people running and zigzagging across the street in utter panic. There's a, a young boy beginning to develop a hostile, antisocial nature. <laughs> Couldn't wait to see this movie. <laughs> I think Revenge of the Creature should probably be called Revenge of the Scientists because there's so much about what goes on in this film where the scientists are, in a sense, tormenting 
this creature in captivity in the name of science as they go through a process of, of negative conditioning. The purpose of this is let him reach for the thing he wants, say, stop, and when he doesn't stop, shock him with the cattle prod. This seems awfully unfair. Offering something he likes, he wants, you know, lure him that way, and then hurt him. Revenge of the Creature was again directed by Jack Arnold, who once more displayed his trademark skills of planning and organization, including shot-by-shot -shot storyboards. Jack Arnold storyboarded most of his films, as far as I'm aware. I have seen storyboard drawings for several of them. The drawing exactly matches the shot. He didn't tend to deviate from that pre-planning. Jack Arnold was uh, very efficient and very well organized, a very good director in terms of technical ability. As far as direction to the uh, actors, um, in terms of acting or emotional uh, uh, support, um, I guess you just sort of, he was the kind of a director that said, you know, stand here, stand there, walk here, walk there. But creative-wise, you just sort of were on your own. No, he just said, do your thing. He liked the way I swam and just sort of left it up to me. I found Jack to be extremely easy to work with. Tom Hennessy, who was the topside creature in that film, uh, he and I roomed together. And uh, at that time, you could have an alligator. He bought a little baby, no, I think it was a caiman, a South American alligator, he bought, and he kept it in the bathtub. So whenever I had to take a shower, we had to get the alligator out of the bathtub. Engrossed in their underwater encounters with the creature, the cast almost forgot about the full-time inhabitants of the Marineland tank, including sharks, barracudas, and moray eels, which swam freely with the performers and crew. They assured us uh, that the uh, fish were fed every hour, and we watched them feed the fish. So we, we felt pretty secure, at least in those days. I guess we were very naive. I suppose today I wouldn't want to do it. I was sitting on the anchor and waiting in between scenes, just breathing on the air hose, and I felt something tugging at my foot. And I looked down, and it was a turtle, big sea turtle. He took a bite out of the heel of the uh, creature's foot and just took a bite and took off with it. So everybody jumped in the water chasing the turtle to get the heel back. They had to dry it with blowers, and they had to glue the heel back on the foot because it was the last pair. So we had to watch out for the turtles. They thought I was food, I guess. Although the first makeup for the Gill Man had been a masterpiece, significant changes were made for the sequel. This head is uh, from Revenge of the Creature, and it's a completely different scope than the original creature head. You can see this head is, is quite a bit rounder and just kind of thicker uh, throughout. The other creature is more of an oval shape, and it's just wider throughout here altogether. Uh, they changed the eyes, which I don't think was a good idea at all. They should have kept with the original more fish eyes. These are more like ping pong balls or something. And the, uh, the whole configuration of the mouth is different. It just has a different look. Like the first film, Revenge of the Creature was shot in 3D, but didn't receive wide distribution in the stereoscopic format. Revenge of the Creature uh, was a bit of, I think, an experiment on Universal's part to see if there would be a revival in 3D. It doesn't work quite as well in 3D, though. Uh, there appeared to have been a lot of problems technically with uh, one of their underwater cameras. It was time consuming uh, in, in reloading and, and getting any ready. It flooded, I think, once, maybe twice. And uh, they had uh, panics time and <laughs> fixing the cameras and getting them ready to go back in the water. 3D is very hard to project. You've got to have a projectionist that's really on the ball. And many of the theaters, the projectionist just didn't care. If either print would run just a frame uh, out of sync with the other, it would destroy the effect. You start to get two or three frames out of sync and it would give you a major headache and uh, be very, very hard on your eyes. And so a lot of people, I don't think, realized, they thought the 3D was just bad. It wasn't, it was bad projection. When you start to realize what was happening in the exhibition end, uh, you could understand why the system died out so quickly. In Universal's final film, The Creature Walks Among Us, civilization once more attempted to tame the Gill Man, this time through radical surgery. They go to the Florida Everglades with the purpose of capturing the creature, and he's inadvertently burned. Ranger 
In order to save his life, they perform emergency surgery. The fire burned away the outer scale. There's a structure of human skin underneath it. Two separate coverings, the way he had lungs and gills. The creature is transformed into a much more human-looking character. And that, that's such an intriguing irony. Now that he's human, he's not graceful anymore. Now that he's human, he's awkward and clumsy. Now he's more human. And he stands there looking out toward the ocean, you know, feeling drawn to something that he can never have anymore. Through a trilogy of films, the creature becomes something human. We begin to understand him as being alone and isolated in a world in which he doesn't fit. And it's that pattern, it's that pattern of evolution within those three films. He gives the creature a durability that doesn't exist in most horror films. Apart from the creature's primal appeal, I think the other thing that sums him up the best is uh, what Billy Wilder had Marilyn Monroe say in The Seven Year Itch about the creature, which was he was kind of scary looking, but he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. But the creature has been loved, thanks to nearly a half century of aggressive marketing by Universal Studios. He's been loved and cherished and most of all collected by generations of film fans. In fact, the creature may have made more off-camera appearances than any other Universal monster. Creature collectibles have included magazines and model kits, figurines, wind-up toys, candy dispensers, wristwatches, even a pinball machine. In fact, there's hardly a product you can name that hasn't made some use of the creature from the Black Lagoon. America's favorite amphibian. I want to thank you fans for keeping the Gill Man alive for all these years because without you, he'd have been dead and forgotten a long time ago. I get, uh, I'd say, five or six letters a month, at least that many, sometimes more. And uh, people will send me pictures, uh, you know, to sign, and they all have great things to say about the movie. I mean, they, they, they love it. and. Uh, they were scared to death, and it's not as uh, bad as some of the, the, the horror films today, and that it leaves something to your imagination. Basically, we're all storytellers, or weavers of dreams. We have monsters in dreams and so on, and maybe it's a way of making friends with those monsters, <laughs> these horror pictures. And I'm delighted that people still enjoy this picture. Using the tried and true formula of Beauty and the Beast, Universal created its last classic monster character, proving once and for all that seaweed could be just as creepy as cobwebs. For more stories about the making of this film and additional information on the cast and crew, be sure to check out our special production notes and feature audio commentary, accessible from the main menu. For Universal Studios Home Video, I'm David Skahl. Thank you.